So, dear colleagues and uh, young intensivists and friends, uh, welcome to today's session of uh, Sunday Critical Care Webinars from Young India Intensivist Forum. This is webinar number 123. The topic today is uh, viral encephalitis, and the speaker is uh, Dr. Rayla Varasi. So, she is a very keen young academician, a very nice urologist, and she's assistant professor, Department of Neurology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. New Delhi. And uh, she has a very distinguished career in a short span. She has 65 publications, has presented many abstracts and papers in international and national conferences, and has been the recipient of many awards. So she's, uh, and she's taken a very nice lecture earlier on acute bacterial meningitis for all of us, which many of you have attended and seen. So uh, looking forward to another great session, Dr. Elavarsi, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll start sharing the screen. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. So, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining on this uh, Sunday evening and sparing your time to listen to my talk on viral encephalitis. Uh, I am aware that you are a group of uh, young intensivists and I hope my, my talk would be useful for you. So just a short background. Uh, encephalitis, as the term means, is inflammation of the brain parenchyma. And today we want to talk about viral encephalitis. So we want to talk about encephalitis that is caused by viruses. It is one of the common causes of disability in young adults and several patients develop long-term sequelae. And that is the importance of early diagnosis and appropriate treatment. It is the second most common cause of encephalitis and the first most common as you would be aware is autoimmune encephalitis. So previously it was thought that viral encephalitis is the commonest cause of encephalitis, but after the uh, advent of so many antibodies that we see today, it has been realized that many cases which were lumped together as viral encephalitis were indeed uh, autoimmune encephalitis and the antibodies were at that point of time unknown to us. So on this date, yeah. if we look at the broad category of encephalitis, viral encephalitis is the second most common cause of encephalitis. So the clinical features, they are fairly uh, protein and we know that the fever, headache, vomiting, like similar to acute bacterial meningitis that we saw uh, the during the last session. The viral encephalitis also pretty much most of the fe clinical features are the same. And uh, the, uh, the presence of uh, focal deficits and seizures are slightly more in viral encephalitis as compared to acute bacterial meningitis. So we need to have an algorithmic approach whenever we are faced with a patient with such presentation. We often have patients with altered sensorium who are not able to give an appropriate history. So the first and the most important step is to take a very detailed history. The onset, the progression, how the illness started. Uh, if the patient is not able to give a proper history, we need to have a good caregiver who was aware of how the disease started. What was the first symptom? Was it fever? Was it seizure? Was it something else that uh, onset and progression have to be clearly ascertained? Drugs and toxins exposure, as we have uh, we were discussing, this is the common cause of altered sensorium and uh, focal deficits along with fever and seizures in a young adult. And these are the very group of patients who are uh, these days exposed to recreational drugs and other toxins, inhalational toxins, glue sniffing, and these sort of activities are also common in the same. Uh, epidemiologic group. So we should never forget these things as well. Then we need to take a detailed travel history. These days people like to go hiking, they go mountaineering, they uh, go to lakes, they start swimming, they do all sorts of adventure activities, sports, etc. And this exposes the patients and the young people to various environmental agents like uh, ticks, uh, for example, or if they went uh, expedition to a a cave or something, they may be exposed to fungi. And these sort of uh, pathogens also can present with exactly same presentation like a viral encephalitis. And so travel history is very important. Then uh, other common thing that often people forget these days is cerebral malaria. Cerebral malaria also can present with high grade fever followed by altered sensorium. It may present with seizures, may be associated with uh, low blood sugar. So often 
it is thought that okay hypoglycemia was the reason for the insulinopathy we have corrected the sugar now let us wait for the insulin to improve in this process malarial parasite is often forgotten so never forget to send a peripheral smear for malarial parasite or these days the point of care antigen testing like optimal is available or a qbc for a buffy coat antigen testing is also easily available in most of the large centers and if it is not available, at least send a peripheral smear to a good microbiologist. They will actually be able to clinch the diagnosis. And similarly, we need to uh, do a detailed clinical examination. And in the clinical examination, obviously, the uh, level of sensorium should be assessed by using a GCS score or some other uh, validated score. The pupils have to be examined because uh, certain type of toxins also can have a similar presentation and the pupils may give you a clue whether it is actually uh, infection or something toxic or uh, metabolic. And uh, then obviously you need to examine, do a, a good general examination, look for needle tracks, uh, strip the patient and uh, look carefully for SCAR in the uh, trunk or in the abdomen, sometimes these findings are actually missed, especially in patients who are slightly darker skin. And uh, coming to the examination, obviously, the any patient who comes to the emergency with emergency or the ICU with altered sensorium, blood sugar is one of the first tests that is ordered. And if it is low, obviously, it has to be corrected. And metabolic parameters, including the biochemical uh, thing and uh, renal and uh, liver parameters also have to be tested for. So these are all routine. Next, coming to the specific investigation. So obviously, the patient is having some neurologic findings. If the imaging has to be done, it has to be uh, tailored. And uh, 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 the first and the most preferred investigation of choice is a CT of the head. And uh, the MR may need to be done urgently if CT is non-contributory or if the diagnosis is unclear. So, uh, sorry. Uh, we need to get a good history and a general examination. We need an appropriate imaging, which would be CT or MR in this case. We need to do the CSF. We, we will do the EG that we will come in the following things. So CSF examination is usually performed. Uh, usually it is done in the emergency setting itself. But uh, it is not very helpful in the acute setting, except for a few things, because most of the patients with any infection of the central nervous system is going to have some lymphocytic pleocytosis. But as we had seen in the last time, if it is a neutrophilic pleocytosis, it is more suggestive of a bacterial uh, meningitis, but it is not hard and fast. Sometimes you may have uh, bacterial meningitis, which is partially treated, can present with a, uh, lymphocytic pleocytosis. It could be tubercular meningitis, which we are actually confusing with the viral encephalitis. So the sugars are usually normal to low. They are not very low as we see in tubercular, bacterial, or in fungal. So they are they might be either in the normal range or slightly towards the lower range. Extremely low sugars are generally not seen in viral encephalitis. Proteins can be high. Then PCR polymerase chain reaction for the viral or DNA, RNA or DNA are, is a specific diagnosis which can clinch the diagnosis. But one thing we should remember is in patients who have HSV encephalitis, if the CSF is done very early, within 72 hours, it can be false negative. So if it if the patient presents to you very early, like day one, and immediately you have sent the CSF for PCR, you had a strong clinical suspicion or you have a imaging which is consistent with um, consistent with uh, HSV encephalitis and you find the PCR to be negative. To be on the safer side, it is uh, better to start the patient on antiviral drugs and following that, you can actually repeat the CSF after 72 hours to see if the PCR turns positive. So these days, PCR panels, biofire panels are widely available and they can actually uh, detect a myriad of uh, viruses, including DNA, RNA viruses like enteroviruses and uh, a multitude of other viruses. This can also be used. But uh, we should also remember that apart from herpes encephalitis, none of the other viral encephalitis have any specific management. And so the PCR panel might not be actually helpful in making a uh, therapeutic uh, difference in the patient. But obviously, most of the patients would like to have a, have a clinical diagnosis which is confirmed by some form of investigation because as we will be seeing in the further slides, we have a lot of differentials and uh, having a PCR positive would actually help us narrow the differentials. Okay.
So CT and MRI findings in viral encephalitis will be showing gray and white matter involvement. So we have a certain signature MRI patterns. As you see here, this is the T2 weighted MR and these structures, these rounded structures on either side of the lateral ventricles, they are the thalami. So in this image, you are able to see symmetrical involvement of both the thalami, which is showing T2 hyperintensities. So this sort of imaging in the in the given clinical setting is highly suggestive of a uh, flaviviral infection. So Japanese encephalitis, dengue encephalitis, they present with this characteristic MRI pattern. But we should also remember that, as I already said, viral encephalitis have a lot of differentials clinically. And similarly, MRI also, we have certain uh, differentials for this particular MRI pattern. So a patient who has bilateral uh, a, a midline artery of pressure on, and that is occluded due to any reason, that leads to this artery of pressure on in part, which can also present with this bilateral thalamic involvement. Similarly, a deep venous infarct also can have this exact same MR pattern. Uh, but the edema is usually larger, but uh, that is not hard and fast. Likewise, thalamic glioma lymphoma also can present with this uh, symmetric bilateral uh, thalamic involvement. Autoimmune encephalitis, is certain autoimmune encephalitis also can have this particular pattern. Now look at the panels on the right side of the screen. Here we see that both the uh, temporal lobes are involved. Here the thalami are spare. So here this temporal lobe involvement, these three are not of the same patient. They are of different three different patients. So the as you see here, the right uh, the temporal lobe is much more severely involved as compared to the left side. Here in this image, you see the medial temporal region is involved, the anterior temporal part is involved. And here also, the right side also, it is subtle, but it is the involvement is there. As you see here, this is the gray matter. The gray matter structure, there is edema, there is loss of the sulci that is not visible. And the temporal pole is also involved. But as you see here, the left side is much more prominent. Left side findings are much more prominent as compared to the right side. Now here we have this third patient in whom we are able to see here also the left side findings are much more significant in the, this is the insular region, this is the thalami, uh, sorry, this is the uh, left uh, temporal lobe, this is the medial portion of the left and the right temporal lobes and as we see here, this is the cingulate lobe. So both the cingulate lobes are involved and here the other side also the insular cortex is involved. So this sort of presentation, this sort of imaging is highly characteristic of a HSV encephalitis, especially when there is diffusion restriction. It is very characteristic of HSV encephalitis, but autoimmune encephalitis and paraneoplastic limbic encephalitis also can have an exactly similar MRI picture. So as we had seen in the previous slide, uh, diffusion restriction is quite common in HSV. And this can help us differentiate an autoimmune encephalitis, especially NMDA encephalitis. Uh, in NMDA, usually uh, diffusion restriction is not seen. And if diffusion restriction is present, that is highly characteristic of a, uh, of a HSV encephalitis. So what are the difficulties that we face in diagnosis? The manifestations are protein, as we saw, fever, headache, vomiting, that can happen in, in, in many other conditions, including something very common like enteric fever. And we had seen these things, cerebral mal uh, malaria, toxic, metabolic, and uh, other things. But let me just emphasize on a few points. So non-convulsive status epilepticus, due to any, any reason, can also have such a presentation. Status epilepticus, can lead to increased uh, muscle activity and that can actually appear as if the patient is having a fever. And similarly, uh, we had seen this artery of pressure on infarct, we had seen cerebral venous thrombosis, because vasculitis also can have a similar clinical presentation. Nutritional deficiency, for example, uh, someone who has uh, significant alcohol consumption, someone who is pregnant and has recurrent vomiting, they can have thiamine deficiency and they, they can also present with su such a similar presentation. Posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or re reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome due to various toxins like cocaine, etc. They can also have such a similar presentation, including the imaging findings, which can be confused with the viral encephalitis. We should never forget uh, neural malignant syndrome. These days, several patients are on um, uh, drugs like uh, SSRIs for depression 
and uh, even for um, uh, dopaminergic blocker agents are being prescribed. Though the first generation drugs are not that frequently used these days, these uh, antipsychotic drugs and antidepressant drugs can have significant drug interactions. Right. For example, if someone is taking for depression, someone is taking a SSRI like a acetylopram and by mistake, someone, uh, the patient develops headache and the patient is prescribed uh, something like a triptan. For example, zolmitriptan uh, nasal spray is used for the treatment of acute migraine. So in such a situation, the patient had a um, might have had a migraine and a headache. And because of that, he or she took zolmitriptan and then went into a uh, serotonin syndrome. NMS and serotonin syndrome can have a similar presentation and they can present, they can be actually confused with uh, cerebral malaria or viral encephalitis. And if we miss the diagnosis and the drugs are being continuously administered, for example, if you continue to administer acetylopram in such a situation, that can actually lead to worsening of the clinical situation. And autoimmune paraneoplastic encephalitis can also have such a exactly similar uh, presentation as we have seen and we will be seeing in few other case vignettes also as we go by. So uh, this, I think this is an important slide from the perspective of diagnosis. We often have this confusion whether this is, suppose a patient who has come into the emergency is presenting uh, with altered sensorium, had some fever, headache, and you find that the sodium is low. Now, is it because of hyponatremia that the patient is actually unconscious or the patient is having some encephalitis and because of that the patient developed a SIADH or a cerebral salt wasting syndrome and that has led to the hyponatremia. It might sometimes it may be very difficult to differentiate and it may be like the chicken and egg story. But by and large, we have certain clinical findings, though I would not say these are very hard and fast and each of it is found in every hundred percent of patients. It's not like that. But you can use this as a guide to probably try to differentiate whether it is encephalopathy or encephalitis. So encephalitis, as we know, is an infection. So fever is much more common. Encephalo in uh, encephalopathy, headache is quite uncommon, but fever, headache, and vomiting, this triad, if this triad is present, probably we are dealing with some CNS infection. And in encephalopathy, the patients might have a steady deterioration, but we also see that in several patients with uh, uh, delirium because of metabolic abnormalities, we can have a fluctuating pattern also. But in the initial stages of encephalitis, the patient usually have a fluctuating course. And uh, encephalitis, depending on the location of involvement of the um, infection, uh, focal neurologic signs might be present, including seizures. And uh, focal signs are generally absent in encephalopathy. If at all you find a plantar upgoing, it is usually bilateral plantar upgoing in patients with encephalopathy. And seizures... Uh, it can be, it is usually generalized seizures in encephalopathy, though hypoglycemia can lead to focal seizures, but in encephalitis, it could be generalized or focal. Now, coming to the blood investigations, leukocytosis and lymphocytic, uh, sorry, neutrophilic pleocytosis is, sorry, leukocytosis is common in the blood and pleocytosis of either neutrophilic or lymphocytic pleocytosis is common in the CSF, while both of these are uncommon in patients with metabolic encephalopathy. Well, if EEG is done, it shows diffuse slowing in encephalopathy, while you may find focal findings like bleds or focal epileptiform discharges in patients who have encephalitis. MR imaging is usually normal in patients who have encephalopathy, while as we have seen in the previous slides, we find focal abnormalities, gray matter and white matter involvement in patients with encephalitis. Now, we have another uh, uh, common condition like ADAM, which is often confused with encephalitis. So in ADAM, what happens is patients usually have a pre, uh, they have some viral prodrome, may have an upper respiratory infection or a GI infection. And uh, within four weeks, they develop some form of uh, neurologic syndrome, like headache, they may have vomiting, they may have seizures, they may have vision loss or other focal findings. But when this ADAM occurs, the initial prodromal infection is gone and the fever has usually settled. And this is happening as a, uh, as a delayed immune manifestation of that particular prodromal infection. On the other hand, in infectious encephalitis is because of direct viral, or in, in viral invasion of the central nervous system. So ADAM is more commonly seen in children, though it can happen in adults also. 
and we uh, we know that uh, even covid vaccination was associated with adam in several cases and similarly influenza and other vaccination can be followed by adam in a small proportion of patients and as we have seen prodromal illness and fever may occur like up to 4 weeks prior to the onset of the focal neurologic deficits and the other characteristic thing is that adam as we know is acute disseminated encephalomyelitis so myelitis can also be present and when we do the imaging if we along with the brain if we do spinal cord imaging and we find lesions in the spinal cord as well that goes in favor of adam as compared to infectious encephalitis but this is also not hard and fast there are certain infectious encephalitis for example um, japanese encephalitis can be associated with anterior horncell involvement uh likewise uh, enteroviral infections also can be associated with the myelopathy but it is quite rare as compared to adam in which uh, myelitis is fairly quite common and as we have seen previously uh in the blood leukocytosis is occasionally occurs in adam but it is quite common in patients with infectious encephalitis and csf pattern is not going to actually help you differentiate between adam and infectious encephalitis though uh csf should be done and pcr should be sent but the general things like cell count protein sugar they are not actually going to help you differentiate between these two entities so let us have a case vignette we had a 15 year old male who developed uh, inability to recognize relatives and he was not taking orally it was associated with positive of movements on the right side of the body and it progressed over 3 days to develop quadriparesis and unresponsiveness if you see this case when it carefully the patient did not have fever the patient did not have did, did not complain of headache though we do not know about the history what the patient had because when we see the patient the patient is completely unresponsive so fever history the family was denying but we are not sure about the rest of things but we one thing is clear that the illness has progressed over 3 to 4 days so this patient comes to the emergency and this is the initial ct head that is obtained so as we see here the temporal lobe is completely hypodense and the insular area is involved on the right side it is asymmetrical and here as we see here the both the sides cingulate lobes are also involved so looking at this picture it is it seems to be very much uh, characteristic of a herpes encephalitis but since we found these red flags on history we then proceeded to mr as you see here the ct findings are more or less confirmed we find that it is still asymmetric the entire temporal lobe is involved the cingulate cingulate bilateral cingulate are involved and the bilateral insular cortices are involved and these areas that are hyper intense on uh, flare show are show, showing diffusion restriction and this pattern again seems very very consistent with the diagnosis of herpes simplex encephalitis if we just look at the mr findings but as we discussed earlier the patient did not have fever and uh, the other things that we found on history was the patient had developed an this illness after an acute stress of long bone fracture he actually was riding on a electric rickshaw and then he that electric rickshaw rickshaw just uh, uh, met with an accident and he fell down from the rickshaw and he had undergone surgery so we suspected maybe there is some metabolic condition that has been uh, unmasked by this acute stress and the tms and gcms revealed citrullinemia which is a urea cycle defect so till the age of 15 years the patient had never had any such uh, acute stress and maybe that is the reason the, the illness was not discovered but when this patient now had an acute stress increased catabolic state increased dietary protein intake because of the fracture they were actually feeding him with lot of protein for the healing to take uh, take place faster and so that uh, probably led to precipitation of the uh, neurologic symptoms so this though the imaging looks very characteristic though the history also to some extent uh, in a young patient the patient suddenly became unconscious of course viral encephalitis would lie in the differentials but since the cardinal clinical features were not there we it made us suspect uh, maybe we are missing something and that is why we had sent for this investigation so we will see another patient uh, this was a, a young male patient who had myasthenia with thymoma and the patient was receiving immunotherapy with azathioprine 
Now this patient over few weeks started developing seizures and with these seizures were not controlled with anti-seizure medications and the patient went into status epilepticus. So this was this case was seen in our institute during the COVID times and um, uh, the patient was suspected to have some form of encephalitic illness and uh, imaging was done though I should say the imaging took some time because of the COVID and the logistics of getting the MR done. So this is the MRI that we see here. Here also both the cingulate lobes are involved. One side temporal lobe is much significantly involved as compared to the other side some involvement of the uh, parieto occipital region on the right side. Medial temporal lobes are involved. The temporal poles are involved. So it was a great diagnostic dilemma. It has this patient developed a herpes encephalitis while on immunotherapy? It was the patient's uh, immune in an immune suppressed state? So a lot of uh, confusion was there. But this imaging pattern is also consistent with the paraneoplastic autoimmune limbic encephalitis. So given the fact that the patient also had myasthenia with thymoma, a strong suspicion of uh, limbic encephalitis was also considered. And this patient's anti-titin antibody came out to be positive in the paraneoplastic profile. That actually increased the diagnostic uh, confidence. And the patient was treated with um, uh, corticosteroids and followed by plasma exchange. And the patient made a remarkable recovery. So as we see, not every patient who has a characteristic imaging picture is uh, uh, actually having viral encephalitis. So we should always keep our list of differentials open, uh, especially often this time and deficiency and these sort of nutritional metabolic parameters uh, might be initially missed thinking that, uh, oh, viral encephalitis is very common. So let us start the patient on acyclovir empirical therapy and then let us wait for the patient to improve. Always keep in mind other things which are treatable, especially the metabolic ones. For, for example, if we miss the metabolic one and keep treating the patient with a uh, high dose of proteins as we usually give in the ICO, 1.5 to 2 gram per kilogram. In such situations, it is going to actually lead to worsening as compared to improvement. And uh, sometimes that may lead to complications that are actually irreversible. So coming to the treatment, uh, as we saw already, uh, apart from herpes, we don't have any other viral encephalitis which has a specific treatment. So acyclovir or valcyclovir should be started as soon as possible if the diagnosis is strongly suspected. Uh, steroids are not generally recommended for the treatment of viral encephalitis, but may have to be used in select cases, especially when the patient has significant uh, cerebral edema due to the uh, acute viral infection. And because of that, if there is... Uh, if there is a lot of midline shift and stuff like that. Maybe steroids might be used to tide over the crisis. Anti-seizure medications are usually prescribed and uh, especially because of the gray matter involvement, the patients often have uh, seizures. So it is actually worthwhile to even prescribe anti-seizure medications empirically if we have a strong suspicion of seizures. And often we give the, the patient therapeutic bundles if the diagnosis is unclear, especially after the initial imaging and uh, uh, after the CSF, if the gram staining is done and it is still negative. If it is positive, then obviously you will strongly suspect biogenic meningitis and you will not be treating with antivirals. But if it is negative, then often therapeutic bundles are given with antibiotics to cover bacterial organisms, biogenic, rickettsial, as well as leptospira. Antivirals might be added to uh, cover uh, cover the viral uh, herpes ones. Antituberculous drugs, steroids, if ADM is a concentration. Steroids are also given as an adjunct in TBM. Sometimes we also cover with anti-malarial drugs empirically, even though it is uh, optimal is negative. And uh, if Wernicke's encephalopathy is a consideration, then time in also might have to be added. And later on, once we once the other investigations start coming in, once the MR is done, maybe you might not be having MR facility to be done overnight, uh, around the clock. So overnight, you treat the patient with this therapeutic bundle. And later on, as more and more investigations are obtained, as the differentials get narrowed, we can step down and remove various uh, necessary medications that are being prescribed. So obviously, supportive care, including ventilation, uh, taking care of nutrition using NG tube, micronutrient uh, management, 
and DVT prophylaxis with uh, pump, DVT pumped or a uh, low molecular weight heparin. All these have to be given, taken care of. And often we need to give stress cell cell prophylaxis also because the patients are critically ill. They are getting many medications, including uh, often steroids or also strike. So stress cell cell prophylaxis is also important uh, in the broader view of the supportive care that we provide. So to summarize, uh, viral encephalitis is common in young adults, but also we have a long list of differentials and we should not uh, get uh, into this uh, narrow view of just considering infectious uh, etiologies. Uh, however, I should also emphasize that early treatment with antivirals is beneficial in HSV encephalitis. There is no specific measure for the treatment of other uh, viral encephalitis. And often uh, in the critical care setting, especially when the patients are sick and uh, uh, we don't have a diagnosis, often empiric therapy is also essential. And we need to keep a watch for red flags. And obviously, we need to keep prognosticating the family, especially in the ICU setting, because long-term sequelae are very common. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Elavara Singh. So can you tell a little about the steroids, like uh, when to use the steroids, which one and what dose? Sir, there, uh, generally, for if we have a clear-cut diagnosis of uh, herpes encephalitis, if the diagnosis is very clear, then steroids are not indicated. There are certain rare circumstances, like, for example, there is chronic herpes encephalitis. Even after you have treated the patient for three weeks, the patient initially responds and later on develops new complications. In that situation, steroids are recommended. We have some observational studies in which we have seen that various doses have been prescribed. People have given methylprednisolone, people have given uh, dexamethasone, oral prednisolone, all forms of doses and formulations have been tried. But in our setting, if the patient is having acute cerebral edema and in order to tide over the crisis, we generally prescribe methylprednisolone at the dose of 20 milligram per kg intravenously for uh, three to five days. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, if you get some other viral encephalitis on the PCR or something, then is there, is it there also for raised ICT, like cerebral edema? Do you give it there also? In rare circumstances, for example, if there is, if the J, uh, this Japanese encephalitis PCR is positive in the CSF, and there is thalamic edema, there is so much edema that the third ventricle is getting compressed. In such a situation, steroids might help. And what about the role for ICP monitoring in, you know, viral encephalitis? Any role because, uh, you know, what is the usual cause of death in viral encephalitis? Sir, so usually if there is deep gray matter involvement, if there is brainstem involvement, that could lead to respiratory failure. But if the ventilatory management is okay, that is uh, usually taken care of. But as we have seen in the imaging, this bilateral insular involvement, cingulate lobe involvement, when these locations are involved, the patients might have autonomic instability. So that could lead to fluctuating autonomic functions, sudden crash in blood pressure, tachycardia, bradycardia. So this autonomic dysfunction also could lead to death in patients. Uh, most of the times, the patients, if they are kept on ventilator for a long time in the ICU settings, they generally develop other hospital acute complications like uh, uh, hospital acute pneumonias, like uh, DVT and other complications. Drug induced AKI, acyclovir can lead to uh, crystalluria and AKI. So these sort of medical complications also have to be kept in mind. Uh, if the treatment is started early for herpes, most patients have a very good recovery. And likewise, the other uh, things like ADAM, uh, paraneoplastic autoimmune, if such the differentials are coming into the picture, then uh, early institution of immunotherapy, uh, rituximab, plasma exchange, all these things, they actually change the um, course of the illness. But in uh, at least in the northern part of the India, since the last few years, Japanese encephalitis has drastically come down because of um, hygienic measures that have been uh, improved as well as the use of uh, vaccination. But still, it is quite a common cause of encephalitis, at least in the northern part of the country, west uh, in UP as well as in uh, certain areas of Bihar. And in such circumstances, only supportive care is um, needed. And sometimes patients have an extrapyramidal reaction, extrapyramidal um, 
syndrome and in such situations uh, uh, this medications like anticholinergic medications like trihexyphenidyl even levodopa can lead to symptomatic improvement mm -hmm. apart from specific antiviral therapy so no other uh, viral illnesses have any specific antiviral uh, therapy actually even if the influ influenza is leading to uh, viral uh, illness uh, not much effect of uh, antiviral drugs and in influenza related encephalitis. Do you think, uh, you know, if you are having evidence of raised ICT, is there any role for ICT monitoring in viral encephalitis? I mean, it's a controversial topic. There's no clear cut guideline, you know. It's, so, you think it'll help if you monitor the ICT or uh, most of the deaths are because of focal involvement and all that? Not really herniation or raised ICT. Patients who have recurrent seizures can have secondarily increased. Sound is gone, Dr. Elavarasi. Sound. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Is it audible, sir? Yeah, yeah now it's come back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there is some problem. I'll just switch off the video. Maybe the. Yeah, okay, okay. Last thing, I'll just finish off. Yeah, yeah. Is it clear now? Yeah. Ah, so, if there is significant bilateral edema, then uh, the, rather than monitoring the intracranial pressure, often doing a bilateral decompressive hemicraniectomy or a unilateral one if there is a significantly asymmetric uh, presentation. So, that can actually relieve the intracranial pressure and thereby save the life of the patient. That is one. Second, just monitoring the intracranial pressure using a ICP catheter is not going to add much to the management. So, if at all the patient is having uh, some alteration in sensorium, worsening new deficits, it would be more prudent to get imaging done and uh, on imaging also we have certain findings, uh, narrowing of the sulci and other certain findings that can help us decide whether to go ahead with the decompression. So per se, not we don't actually recommend uh, continuous intracranial pressure monitoring. One, because it is an invasive procedure and that itself leads to the risk of uh, infections. And uh, two, it is cumbersome as well as it is uh, quite difficult to calibrate. Okay, Dr. Elavarsi, I think we'll stop it there. Uh, there's a problem with your audio also. So thank you so much. And uh, I thank the audience uh, for their patient hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.